that we are doing doc that we are doing documentary workshops online. Um, and it's been, I think, uh, a lot of fun for me and I think uh, worthwhile for, for a lot of students. Um, I am thrilled to, sometimes I, I carry the weight by myself, sometimes I don't, sometimes I have special guests. And today I have a very special guest. I'm thrilled to present to you Ariel Nasser who uh, not only has been doing documentary films for some 15 years now, but is uh, presently, he's also presently the inter an interim producer at the NFB for Quebec and Atlantic Canada. Um, so he's very, very, very involved in documentaries. And more importantly, he has, um, he has done, and I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Ariel, but this is your biggest claim to fame. He has uh, uh, written and directed uh, a wonderful film called The Forbidden Reel, which we will be dissecting today. Um, the Forbidden Reel is about Afghanistan. Ariel is Afghani from on his father's side. He will surely go, uh, explain to you uh, th that part. Um, and it is both a uh, um, a, a very timely film, as you know, I mean, Afghanistan is very much on the map yet again, uh, not necessarily for the right reasons. There are a lot of films on Afghanistan right now. In fact, we showed uh, early on in the semester, uh, Julian Shares, The Ghosts of Afghanistan, a more political, journalistic kind of film. This is, this is the kind of film um, that you don't see that often. You don't see uh, actually at all this uh, in, on Afghanistan. It is a film that has many, many sides to it. But before uh, I, um, I, I, um, I, I, I go on about this, I, uh, I want to show you just to set the table, I would like to show you the, the opening minutes of the film, just so you get, your, you get the feeling. I will share my screen right now. So many aspects of Afghan culture have been systematically destroyed or erased or forgotten. The Afghan Films Archive has been preserved almost entirely intact through all of these years where so many other things were burned or looted or blown up. The Afghan Films Archive, through the efforts of the people who worked there, who felt so strongly about the work that they did, they managed to preserve these films and these records of all of these other Afghanistans that existed before this recent period of iconoclasm and destruction because they believed these films had something to give to the present moment. So I think that um, kind of sets the stage before I hand it over, I, 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 I start asking Ariel a bunch of questions. I just want to say that this, th this is an extraordinary film because it's really three films in one. It is about, as you've just heard, about the Afghanistan no one ever talks about or certainly not, not in the outside world. We always see the, the, the violent, the, the war-torn Afghanistan. So this is about the other Afghanistan through the rescuing 
of uh, and, and Ariel will be telling us about it, the, the Afghan film archives, um, uh, which has preserved so much of, of, of the, that other Afghanistan that in many ways uh, has disappeared. Uh, but it is also, so that's the first, I, th I believe the, 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 the first part of the, the first aspect of the film, the one that jumps out at you. And then of course, it because of all those archives, it is an extreme, extremely gripping recount of the last 50 years of the history of the last 50 years uh, through this amazing archives. And finally, uh, um, it is also about the love of cinema. It, uh, I, I think this is one of the, the really quite endearing aspects of the film. So Ariel, without further ado, hello, welcome to uh, documentary, uh, our doc documentary workshop. Can you tell us what puts you on this track? What, why did you feel you, wanted, you needed to make this film? Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me today, Francina. It's really an honor to be here with you and Professor Wayne Larson, and 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 thank you guys for 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 inviting me. And uh, I'm um, I'm really I'm really pleased with the way that you uh, viewed the film and and analyzed the film because I think you you really uh, you really got it spot on. It's a film that that has many layers, right? It has layers formally in terms of the. Um, the cinema, right? It has these layers of um, live action, present day, and archival, and then reenactments that are kind of couched and coded within the, the the archival material. And I think you're right. It also has three layers of uh, of meaning in a certain way. It's a film about history. It's a film about cinema, and it's also, um, you know, I mean, in some ways, it's also about the lives of these artists who. Um, who made all of these films about other people, but never really had a film made about them themselves. You know? And um, I, what what put me on the track to make this film is really, I mean, I think I think I have to go I, I have to go back to tell this story of of my own um, you know journey in 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 this particular particular production. I have to go back to really being a child and growing up in in Canada with um, you know Afghan father, American mother. And uh, my father telling me from a very early age um, that I was Afghan and, 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 and telling me his stories and, and really sharing uh, that side of his culture with me. But as I got older, um, you know, at that time, my father, this is back in 74, I mean, uh, that my father first came to Canada, right? So I was born some years later. Uh, and um, my dad, you know, was still, when I was born, he was still the only Afghan in the city of Halifax where we lived, you know? So um, it's funny, like years later, I remember hearing from people, um, you know, your dad was a, a, an Afghan prince, right? I mean, is that right, you know? And uh, it, it was what I find funny about that is that over the years, I've met so many people who have told me, oh, you, you, you have roots in Afghanistan, you're Afghan. So, so you, you, do you know my friend? And then they, they name their friend who's an Afghan person. And, th and then they say, well, he's a prince uh, or, or she's a princess or she's a, and, and it's, it's lovely because, you know, Afghanistan has had these, it's had this, this monarchy, which you see, you glimpse a little bit in the film. And because it's it's got such a history, and it and it, and it really does, even though there isn't in history in Afghanistan, there's this real oral tradition, and people remember everything, you know. So so everybody who has who has had a link to one of the royal families carries that pride with them, you know. And my father, um, you know, came from this kind of, you know, honestly, I went back and visited my grandfather's house in Afghanistan, and 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 my father's story of, of growing up in a castle all of a sudden made a lot more sense to me when I saw that the castle was made of mud and only one story high. But, um, you know, this was um, privilege in Afghanistan in those days, they were feudals. And um, so uh, these stories of Afghanistan, of my father's childhood, of growing up, the son of a feudal leader who um, used to have his own uh, court, inside his living room and even his own prison where he would be able to temporarily imprison people who had committed crimes in this area. Um, you know, they, they, they created in my mind um, the image of, of my father's Afghanistan. And yet I didn't have any actual documentary evidence of this time. I didn't have pictures. My father's pictures had burned in a house fire in Kabul um, after he left the country in 1974. 
And so in some ways, as a child, I was always uh, searching for images of Afghanistan. I became quite obsessed, in fact, and uh, to the point where I used to trace the map of Afghanistan over and over and over because I wanted to be able to draw it by heart. And I think it was just a desire to have some connection that I was missing to this country that I knew I was part of, but I didn't quite understand how. Um, so in the 80s, many of my, my family came uh, because of the Soviet Afghan war uh, and they came to Canada and we were surrounded by more and more Afghan family and culture and and feeling more and more connected to that tradition but without again without these visual traces that um, felt important to me so I would scour used bookstores and everything I could find on Afghanistan I would buy and so the first time I went to Afghanistan it was in 2005 you know I had all these stories in my mind about Afghanistan and and stories of my family but also the stories of journalists because I had read every everything I could get my hands on. And so I went to this Kabul that I felt I almost knew, you know, and I, um, but, you know, it was so different. Uh, Kabul and Afghanistan as a whole. And at that time in 2005, I was able to travel the whole country. It was so different from, you know, what I had read. It, it had changed so radically. And it was in the process of changing so radically. In 2005, you could still walk for 20 minutes with ruins on both sides. You know, the city still had these huge tracts of bombed out buildings. And so um, I wanted to try and find some trace of my father's Afghanistan, visually speaking. And so um, it wasn't until 2009 that I actually met engineer Latif. And I had moved to Afghanistan. I decided after making uh, my first long form doc, Good Morning Kandahar, to move to Afghanistan and make my next film from there. And also just to reconnect with my family there and my roots there. And so I lived there for a few years. I lived there till 2012. And over that time, I got to know engineer Latif Ahmadi, who's this sort of main, one of the main characters in the film. And he was this like very um, intimidating in some ways guy who, presided over the like film office of Afghanistan. It was called Afghan Films. And all I knew about this place was that they were supposed to give you permission if you did any film production. And um, so being an Afghan citizen, because I had gone to the trouble to get my citizenship and you know, I was traveling easily between the two countries. And I felt, you know, with this privilege, I also had to have the responsibility to actually do things the way that Afghan people would do them because so many of my foreign colleagues you know we're just skipping all that stuff and they just go and get their footage and they get out of there right but I, I thought it, I it really need to figure out what it is that I'm supposed to do so I went down to this office Afghan films and it's this like run down but somehow beautiful old building that's this complete film facility but I didn't see all that at first you know all I saw was I was supposed to go down this hallway and go into this dark and dingy office. And in there, there was um, this man wearing like this gray watch cap and like a khaki jacket. And above his head, there was this big, is the only decoration in the entire room, this big uh, three-dimensional um, model of like the most incredible film campus you could ever have, film production studio you could, something like Chinichita in Italy or, or like some kind of Hollywood back lot. And, um, but with all kinds of buildings and bridges and gardens and all these film studios. And it said at the bottom, Afghan films. And I knew I was in Afghan films and Afghan films was actually just a couple of dingy buildings that really needed some work, you know, and a hole in the ground where it looked like something had started to be built. And um, so I asked him about it and he said, yeah, that was during the communist period, the Soviets had planned to build Afghanistan into the film hub for Soviet Central Asia. So for all of the, all of the Central Asia, huge, piece of land, huge piece of territory, all these different uh, countries that had become uh, communist. And it never happened, but he had kept it there. And I, as I learned later, it's because, you know, those years, those communist years for him were the golden age of cinema. Those were the years when he was able to do the most work. And um, I learned that he had this reputation for being still a communist. And at the time he was very control oriented. He wanted every single production, anytime you were gonna roll a camera, he wanted to be able to sign off on it, you know? Anyway, so over time we became good friends, uh, long story, but basically I did a lot of productions there, big and small, commercial, anything you can imagine from the bizarre and surreal to uh, just feel producing for TV uh, in the West. And, um, you know, we just became friends. I started to uh, rent his equipment. I found out he had um, 
uh, a beautiful German made dolly and a beautiful German made crane and the crew that knew how to use these things. And so I started integrating these into our productions, all the commercial stuff I was doing for, you know, Afghan telecom companies and different stuff. And then, um, you know, I made this film, I produced this film, this short film, uh, Buzkashi Boys, because then mostly, actually it was, it was a beautiful um, partnership between Canadian, mostly Canadian and a few Americans, and then Afghan crew, and we put together this beautiful team. So an American director who I met in Afghanistan. And we made this film, and the film went to the Oscars. Uh, it was nominated for an Oscar, it was a short film. Nominated in the short film category. And, and for a lot of the people who had participated, this was a really important, you know, this was a really big deal. It was really a point of pride for them. And Latif was, was participating with us. And after that film, he said to me, I want you to produce my film next. I didn't even know he was a filmmaker. So I was like, what, what is your, like, can you show me one of your films? You know, I was kind of expecting him to maybe um, uh, have been an aspiring filmmaker, you know, but in fact, he gave me this incredible film on DVD called Akhtar the Joker. And it was this beautiful 16 millimeter black and white feature satire that was so political and so well made and original that I was completely blown away. I didn't end up uh, producing his next film, but I, um, I formed a friendship with him. And uh, that was the beginning really of this journey because as I started to discover his films, I discovered this entire legacy that I had known nothing about of filmmakers going all the way back to the 50s. And I met more and more of them. And I understood that there was this group of filmmakers in Afghanistan who had created a national cinema that was really aimed at documenting Afghan history um, from an Afghan perspective and also um, trying to promulgate more liberal values around human rights and women's rights. And so um, I felt in many ways that I saw these all these similarities between what I had been doing in my documentaries, trying to document this kind of changing Afghanistan and what they had been doing. And I felt that I'd found my, um, I don't know, my somehow my heritage, you know, my like spiritual heritage. I'm gonna stop you heritage. there, just because yes. I'd like to introduce, no um, uh, just to keep, uh, to get more and more a taste of, of the film, sure. your characters. I mean, the film is essentially built on three main characters. One you've mentioned, Engineer Latif, great character. Another, the other, uh, Sadiq Barmak, who will also head Afghan films. And, and finally, the, the, mood, uh, the, the last filmmaker that we'll meet later on. But I just want to get a, give people a taste of the first two people and, and uh, that you've been, well, you've been mentioning one anyway. Here we go. Mm. Um, okay, so uh, where do I go? من یکی از آرتیست‌های سینما هستم و این شو کامرایم بود. این وقت در درون من این شو کشته بشه. وقتی که من بسیار تفل بودم یاد میای او سنا به خاطر میای که من همراه مادرم رفتم به سینمای زینب. اندیشه ای که مدام تفلی خود کردم برای دستت و ای بود که چطور امکان داره که آدم ها پیش روی من را برن آدم ها عرکت بکنن خب بعضی وقتا انسان ها ات فکر میکنن که یک چیز در درونشان اونا را پیوان میته اما نمیفهمن که او چی است وقتی که در زندگی خود با او مواجه میشن باز میفهمن که ای در وجود ما در درون ما وجود داشت با زمانم در خانه کتی یک بچه ماوایم در یک زیج زمینی خانهشان ما اونجا سینما جور کردیم شیشه ها انداختیم اکس های رنگ رنگ آوردیم و فکر کردیم که اینمی سینمایی است که ما میریم تجربه سینما اولین بار برمیگرده به اینکه من 
حدود چهار ساله و نیم بود فکر میکنم که ما از پنشیر به کابل آمدیم و یادمه که خدا بیامرز پدرم که افسر پلیس بود در کابل ما اصرار میکردم که هر هفته مرا سینما ببره و هر روز جمعه ساعت دو مرا میبرد در سینمای آریانا اونجا فیلم های اروپایی زیادتر نمایش میدن و فیلم های امریکایی و ما همیشه از فرصت استفاده میکردم میرفتم دنبال امی جای میگشم که اتاقه کجاست که نور ده و بالاخره یک روز برا خودم یافتم اونجا از اینا بالا شدم که یک آدمک موی سفید چشته و یک ماشین کلام است کاکا اینجازه است من بیدیم چی است چی است چی است خوی یک ماشین سینما است این فلم است اینجا میمانند چالام میکنند و تو فلم رو بیدیم زندگی من واقعا با این مسئله گره خود و من تمام بعد از اون تمام روزا فکر میکنم که این ماشین رو باید به خودم جور کنم و بسازم ولی چیزی که بهتون بسیار برای من جالب بودی که چه قصه میتونه موسیقی برش بتونم چیگونه میتونه این آدم ها گپ بزنم متوجه شم که این اصل سینما تنها تکنولوژی نیست تنها تخنیک نیست ولی که پوسی بسیار مهم دیگه است خلاقیت تفکر اندیشه به اینکه سینما هنر است اوکی سو ام Ariel, are you there? <laughs> yes. Um, so that's, we met engineer Latif and also Sadiq Barm, is it Barmar or Bar, Barmar? Barmak. 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 Yeah. Um, two who will, who will play an important role in your film because they were both heads of the Afghan film archives and whose lives were intertwined with the his with everything that was happening through those tumultuous years. But what I'm what I love about your introduction of those characters is how you take the time to situate their love of film. You know, I mean, there's something of cinema paradiso in, in, in those in, in parts of that. Why was that important for you? Well, I think in Afghanistan, the cinema became a kind of uh, ideology in a certain way. It's very interesting because, you know, it's not just a convenience. It's not just an entertainment in a country where um, there was much less literacy than, than we have here. Um, you know, this was a way to build national culture. This was a way to spread important messages about human rights across the country. And um, so it became a kind of mission for these filmmakers. They saw in, um, in this medium, a real modernity, right? I mean, cinema is often associated with modernity because it's mechanical and, you know, it was very new and shocking. And they saw in it uh, uh, both uh, kind of uh, progressive uh, modernity, and they also saw in it a way to communicate uh, across, um, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, boundaries, cultural boundaries. Um, these messages and so what they did was they would they would make these films and often you see in these films that women are playing these very prominent roles you know and even if in a lot of Afghanistan at that time um, you know you know women didn't have as much of a voice but there was uh, this was a way in a, in a sense to kind of uh, send some of the progressive culture of the capital out into the provinces and this is in some ways how they saw the project. So, you know, can you imagine being part of this group of cinema artists who's inventing a national cinema for the first time? What responsibility they must have felt mm -hmm. and what pride they must have taken in what they mm -hmm. were doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it was a time and place and Afghanistan was really um, going through a really wonderful period of, of uh, reform and negotiating with modernity and um, so um, yeah cinema found its place and these artists uh, you know they were like I think in some ways they were so respected because they were doing this thing that wasn't well understood inside Afghanistan at that time you know and so yeah so you have cinemas opening up across the country in all the cities you have people dressing up as nicely as they can to go to the cinema and and if they couldn't wear a suit, they would be offered a suit jacket at the door and a tie, like in a French restaurant, you know? Oh, yeah. And uh, 
you know, so, and the cinema was a place for people to mingle. You have high class and low class. It's not expensive to go to the cinema, but it's something that people from all different classes can do. And um, I think it became a kind of great unifier. And so in some ways, as Barmax says, you know, he became, he wanted to be a member of the cinema party, you know. I really do think that for them, it, it was a kind of ideology about, um, about progress, um, really, and unity, national unity. So now I, I want to show a little uh, excerpt of of, um, of Miriam Gani, who who plays also as, she's she more or less the narrator of the film in a way. And if, in fact, she kind of feels like your alter ego. Uh, am I right? <laughs> in the sense that mm -hmm. she is uh, she's someone from uh, who's Afghani Afghani but lives outside of Afghanistan. Is very involved in rescuing the art, you know the heart and soul of of Afghanistan through the film archives. Give us just a, a little word about uh, the film archives and why, like this is really the, you structure your film about her digital, is trying to re-digitalize, is it? Or digitalize uh, the, 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 whole, the whole archives, is that right? Well, I mean, like, as you know, the film is structured really historically, right? So it goes from yeah. the past to the future. And then there's this contemporary thread, which as you say, has, her try and trying to help with the digitization and really Ibrahim Arifi at the time who was like really spearheading that but but she was bringing resources and helping them to find a way um and, you know I didn't I, I tell you I didn't include Marion because of her connection to uh politics you know because her father was the president of Afghanistan for, for years mm -hmm. Um, this is not why she was included in the film. The reason was because actually all these years that I had been involved with the archives, since I really got to know it in 2009, I, I had been hearing about Mariam because Mariam had done um, many little things for the archive. And then at some point she actually was able to bring um, technicians from India to actually do an early digitization project, very low quality digitization, but as a kind of pilot project. And my uncle had worked for her actually on that um, as a translator because Mariam doesn't speak Dari. In fact, Mariam is interesting in some ways, like you say, like I, I saw in her like someone similar in a way because she was she grew up in the you know in the United States. Her mother is Christian Syrian, so her mother's non Afghan. Her father is Afghan, and she had sort of this bicultural thing because growing up in, in, in New York, she was very American, but also Afghan. So, yeah, in some ways, I think there was a bit of, um, yeah, identity there. But, um, you know, I think I had to include her in a lot of ways, I felt, because she had been really instrumental in this, in this uh, effort to do the digitization. So right. I felt that to, to leave her out would be... Uh, to, to leave out an right. important part of the story. We'll just get a little taste of, of, of who she is and what she's up to. Okay. Uh, why do I keep losing this? Okay, um, 19. is to try to understand what you actually have. The view of Afghanistan outside of Afghanistan is so monolithic. And I think the earlier Afghanistans that existed, Afghan intellectualism, Afghan modernism, Afghan leftism, all of these other histories are actually present in this archive. And to see them acted out on film it really changes the way that people think about Afghanistan. We've been seeing, especially in the past few years, these incidents of really extreme violence. 
And it's important to be reminded that there were decades when Afghanistan was not a place where violence was normal. Okay, so is it safe to say, Ariel, that you did this film, your main motivation for this film was to change the way that people think about Afghanistan? Hello? Yeah, I think you've picked up on something important there. Like that, I think in, in all of my work on Afghanistan, that's been that has been uh, part of my motivation. I think in this one, I also um, really wanted to make something for my cousins. You know, I wanted to make something for my family. You know, I wanted to make something for people who uh, have a connection to Afghanistan as well. You know, that wouldn't necessarily become because in some works you become you become so intent on making it legible to um, sort of outsiders to, to, to the situation or the country or the place that in some ways you, you aren't able to, to do the kind of layering and, and complexity that you want to do. And so here I felt a little freer to kind of, even though, you know, to kind of let things move a little quickly. And I've heard this from, from people who don't have connections to Afghanistan, that they had to watch it twice before they really kind of, got the the historical flow um uh, you know but when when it's shown to an afghan audience it's it's the reaction is really wonderful it's really wonderful i mean it's just like happy and grateful because it's like this is a film that doesn't slow things down to the point where you know it's like simplistic and it tries to maintain complexity and that complexity i think is present in afghan history and i think when you do something about afghan history key maintaining that kind of complexity is important so showing in other words that you know despite these different ideologies that were battling within the country people on either side of those ideologies were still able to come together over certain things even a Taliban official was uh, willing to risk uh, his his potentially his reputation to um, and potentially his life really to to save those films. So, um, so I, I I wanted to always I think our job as doc filmmakers for me, you know, among other things, is to complexify, not to simplify things, yeah. but to complexify them. Yeah. Well, as I say, this is a very, very rich, very complex film, and we're about to hit the really deep uh, stuff, the, uh, the, the histo all the historical events, which I think you have shown in a way that I, you know, I, you know, I'm sure it's been said before, but the way it is shown and said here, it is such an eye opener. Um, but I, I just want to, before I, I, I continue showing uh, segments, uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you are allowed to ask questions at all times. So uh, if you have any questions so far, please, you can ask them. Uh, there, we're not going to wait till the very end for you to have to, to, answer, to ask all your questions. So are there any questions for Ariel so far? You can also write them in the chat and Robin will relay them to us if you, if you prefer that mode. No hands up, no, no. Yes. I have a question. Hi. Um, I was wondering how long it took you to gather um, or like do the research by going through all the archival footage. Like how long did the entire research take and then the gathering, like the selection process of what you're going to include? Good question. So, yeah, so I spent a couple of years on that, really. I mean, I think you could say it was ongoing through the creation of the film. I didn't stop researching, um, you know, it was interesting. I mean, different types of research, but um, even certain important things I wasn't discovering until the very end. So it, it, there were some nice surprises that revealed themselves toward the end of the process. Um, but, you know, because they didn't really have a catalog, I mean, there was some sort of partial database that was created, but it wasn't very useful yet. It was in process. The, really the way they had to do the research was to go and talk to the archivists and say like, 
tell me about this period of time and what you have and 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 then and then like put stuff on a projector like an old soviet projector and, and project it because there was for most of the stuff there were no digital copies and you know only only the archivist knew what was there and so there was this kind of human catalog you know but uh, but that's it so it was time consuming so i would i spent weeks just um at a time going to afghanistan just for research and just sitting in this little screening room um, and in Afghan film and watching and watching these reels and asking, ordering up uh, different things by by different associations. And we would just have conversations and then things would come up and, and then I would want to see that and I would make paper notes. And so it took a really long time. Um, and then, you know, there were challenges to getting that material as well. Um, ultimately, it was fantastic because we were able to um, create this really symbiotic relationship where um we were helping them with their digitization efforts and and then you know as a as a uh, there was a reciprocity to what was happening and so that that felt really good and eventually we were able to digitize 19 of the films um here in canada in montreal at the national film board of canada's kind of state-of-the-art um facility and uh, so those are the best copies that exist of those films and it was really exhilarating to be able to do that and bring those back and say here it's some tangible you know, something tangible for for you. Um, so yeah, so that that's it was a long process. Um, so I would I, so now uh, the the real uh, the real fun begins, shall we say, when the the history like the the, the Afghanistan that you've seen, uh, who is basking in a, a new cinema and a fairly modern era and intellectualism, all of that. Uh, all of a sudden, this is going to hit a wall with the Soviet invasion. I'm, we're going to show a part of of uh, of of that uh, very essential part of of Afghan history. So, put on. Here we go. I can't, I can't always be spot on, so. میدان هوایی کابل یک اپ جا پیدا شده بود یک باره یک جت جنگی نظامی پیاری جنگی پرواز کرد و یک بم خود انداخت و یک انفجار را اینجا بپرید شد ما آجل خانه رفتم کاکایم که صاحب منصب اردو بود و ارتش در خانه بود بسیار جگرخون بود بسیار ناراحت بود ما خود کاکا چی کم شده گفت که میگن که خلقی ها کودتا کردن هموطنان گرامی برای اولین بار در تاریخ افغانستان آخرین بقایای سلطنت زل استبداد و قدرت فامیل خاندان نادرخان صفاک خاتمه یافت و تمام قدرت دولت به دست خلق افغانستان قرار گرفت امید، صدا مشنوی؟ مشنو، انقلاب است امید، مردم چی میگن؟ مردم خوش هستن مردم این روز از خدا میخواستن راشوی گمی؟ بله دانگاه رو گروپوز کردن از کرار رو در بغل میگیرن بچه شو دیگی؟ بله شما خوش نیستین؟ تا بیرون ماشر از کل چارگه رو تان گرفتن از برای خدا نفس بریم خانی پایی پدا جان کل ما بریم خانی پایی بریم امیرا اما چیز از این سیم حمید گوه امیرا بله بسیار خوب و میادم از تازه جوان بودم این سنف هفت مکتب بودم که سال سیزده پیند و هفت انقلاب سوار به پیروزی رسید یک تعدادی که مثلا اونا هم مخالفین خود داشتن و طرفدارای خودم داشتن مردم طرفدارشون هم بودن 
توده ها نسل جوان و کسانی که با ایدیه های به اصلاح بگویم کمونیستی آماده شده بودند خب طور یکی دو روزش تیر شده بود که برای من نامه رسید که تیم یا با فیلم دساور انقلاب فیلم برداری چون او وقت هیچ کس گفته نمیتونست نه چون که فیزلوی امین امی هدایتش بود که باید ای فیلم از سر تا آخر اما طوری که قصه رسیدن ما به قدرت ایجاب میکرد و ما قصه کردیم و شنیدیم و نوشته کردیم و ما امروزه فرم برداری کنیم که چطور بایرق داود خان تا میشه و ایوازش بایرق سرخ یا بایرق پرشمی ها بالا میشه اگه بایرق داود خانه که پس بالا کردیم این که یک دیگر تونگه بیکنند و بازاره که دیگر بچه برگشت اقلاب برگشت کرد این اقلاب برگشت کرد این گپ دان بدان شد دان بدان شد که از بیا فامیدن امی دوست رفیقای خلقی این رفیقای خلقی اولین کاری که کردن رفتن در دکانا پل ریش پیدا کردن شروع کردن در تراشیدن بروتای خود چرا یکانه مشخصی برادرهای خلقی ما همی بود که بروتای بسیار زیاد دبل داشتن ولی حفیظ رای همین و این بسنده نکد که یارا ببخشن امون لحظه ادایت داد که کل از یارا جمع کنین در هر جایی که از کس بروت خود تراشیده جمعش کنین این جمع کرد یک یک دی بسیار زیاد شد و دستور داد که اینا رو ببرین زندان صحبت صورت گرفت و چه قسم اینا رو در پولیگون از با این بورد دیگه او باز قصه سیکریتی بود که پیش خودشان بود یک دوست داشتون دوست بیسا سمیمی بود روزها با ما صحبت میکرد و میگفت که سری جوار هستی و انرژی و نیرو داری بیا در حزب ما برش میگفتم که جان من ترس دارم از حزب و این خاطر که مرا محدود بسازه حزب یک تفکر جمعی بسته است من اجازه بیتیم من عضو حزب سینما باشم جالب بود یعنی من اسم کردم اول هم مگه خوشحال بودن برای که فکر میکردم در هر تغییر امکان داره زندگی شدارم تغییر بکنن ولی من در نهایتش فکر میکردم که سینما تو خاک شد جدا برای که وقتی که فکر کرده بود که آیا این تغییر بازم اجازه میتن ما امون فلم های دلخواه ما رو ببینیم آیا امکان داره که ما باز فلم های دیتکتیف و فلم های پولیسی امریکایی و یا ایتالوی رو ببینیم برازی که زمزم هایی رو شویده بودم که اینا زد غرب هستن و اگر هر چیز هم باشه تنها شوروی و روسی خواهد بود زبان و قلم از وقت مارس و باستور و بیشت هفت میزان سیزت و جاو هفت آجز است کار دران و زحمت پیشان افغانستان رژیم های فرید و مستبد زد خلقی از نام شما از خود شما می تسیدن ولی جمهوری دیموکراتیک افغانستان برخلاف آنها به شما می نازد و شما اتکا می کند و برای شما تمامی تسهیلات لازمه را با وجود خالا <تصفيق> This is Soviet uh, negative film. No, positive. Soviet. Yes, it's a positive. Sabur Tufano, my name is. Bosalam Sangi.
پروژکتورای روسی زیاد بودن در افغانستان و پروژکتورای روسی سکرش بیدن You see very different kinds of films being made at different times. This is a history and a series of historical shifts that you can trace. And it's one of the reasons that the archive is so valuable and it provides such an important kind of way to look at Afghan history that is impossible to find anywhere else. And what's valuable about it is not only what you see on the film, but how the films were made. You know, all the clues that are embedded in how the films were made and how they were made differently in the different times. خب افغان فیلم به میان آمد او هم هدفش ساختار فیلم های فکشن نبود فقط بسنده میکد به سفرهای شاه و یا رجال برجسته در کشور و یا فعالیت ها و اتفاقات و رخدات هایی که در جامعه رخ میداد او را میگرفتن ولی اما وقتی که باز انقلاب هفت سال شروع شد اندشه ها در برابر خونه کاملا تغییر کرد زمینه پیدا شد سوری <تصفيق> دادر برای ساختن فیلم در افغانستان ما تقریبا در حدود کارگردان های ما در حدود شش فیلم در سال تولید میکدن Okay, I'm going to stop it there just because I feel it might help um, so that uh, you know um, not only is it a fascinating history but you know the the idea which we have to I think lost in the West thanks to our closeness to Amer to American politics and everything, is that there was really two parts to the communist revolution. There were the people who, who were happy and, 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 and brought actually a renouveau in, in art and women's role in society. And then there, were, there, there was the other part. Huh? You could, Ariel? Yeah, I think that's accurate. Um, you know, I think if you look at the numbers, I think the vast majority of Afghanistan was um, was was opposed. Um, you know, and and but you know because I mean at the time of the uh, Sour Revolution, the um, the the revolution, the communist revolution, there was only about ten thousand uh, communist party members, so it was not a massive widespread movement, but it. Existed within the upper echelons of um, the military uh, as well as other institutions, so uh, it was possible for them to um, to gain power. Um, and but I think that the 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 leftist foment, the leftist movements were in Kabul were very genuine. Like I think those were those were very real and genuine uh, movements. And they were but they were very pluralistic. There was Maoism and Marxism and Leninism and all this stuff, you know. So. Um, I think that unfortunately that the, the, the dream of the communists, the, those who had theorized in the universities and, you know, formed these parties, unfortunately, uh, you know, turned into a nightmare. But, um, but as you say, over the course of that uh, nightmare, uh, not everyone suffered from communism. I mean, you have these enclaves where there was communism inside, functioning inside these cities. And uh, I personally know people who um, felt that uh, that was a really good change, uh, uh, in particular women who um, had careers uh, that started during those times. And for the first time, they were able to pursue these careers that were open to them in media and arts and, and leadership, you know. So, um, yes, absolutely. Um, you know, everything this is again, this is the complication, you know, it's 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 uh, let's 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 get away from those simple oppositions and binary stuff that was created for us because of the cold war because this was all propaganda. Right. everything you saw about afghanistan in the 80s should be considered propaganda right, right? we were in the middle it's, of a war it's interesting because you know we like to think um that the americans brought you know women's lib and everything to to afghanistan but actually the Russians did before them. The in Soviets a way. did before them, yeah, and in some ways were more successful at it. I mean, a lot of uh, there's a lot of traces of their development that happened that are still useful to Afghans. Uh, these yeah. massive neighborhoods called Makoryan that were Soviet architecture built, and they they still are some of the best housing in Kabul. Uh, the Salang Pass, which is an absolutely essential um, route uh, in Afghanistan. 
Um, so, and, and the women who were uh, able to do those things that we talked about during the Soviet period, a lot of them went on to um, continue to fight and have their careers and actually be real treasure, national treasures, like Yasemin Yarmol is one example of that. She originally became an actress under the communism, and she's the best known actress in Afghanistan now. And she, before that, now she's in France since, since August 15th, but before the, the Taliban came, she went back, she was, um, I mean, she was in, like, she would be in four nationally televised serials at the same time. You know, she was like the hardest working woman Big in show star. Yeah. Is it safe to say we get the feeling, to, listening to Engineer Latif and Sadiq, uh, that the happiest people, in a way, were the people at Afghan films? At, at, during the communist period because oh they, i see what you mean um yeah i mean i think you know i mean all of a sudden there was a lot of more financing for films right but i mean it wasn't for everybody and as the film tells you um you know for example sadiq barmak because he was from an area that was associated with the resistance movement he yeah. um he was not, uh, he was excluded and ended up leaving and joining. So some of your uh, allegiances here were not so much ideological. You know, in his case, it wasn't so much ideological as it was uh, practical because he, he simply wasn't allowed to participate in the communist art making project. So he, he left for the, and, and this is the pattern you see in the film. These people are so, um, these filmmakers are so passionate about cinema that really, uh, all other ideological considerations are second in some ways. Hi, Asia. I, uh, it was nice to see you. Thanks for coming today. <laughs> um, so before I, I go on to show the, the segment of the rise of the Mujahideen, which is another important period, maybe you can just tell us a little bit. Uh, there will be, we'll hear a bit about this, but in fact, as you said, most of the people were not too happy. Who would? Uh, it's an invasion, right? It's a it's a it's a revolution for some, but it's really a coup, a communist coup. It's an invasion, uh, so a lot of people are starting to resist, right? Uh, you that have is the communist the... revolution happening in seventy eight in the spring, exactly, and then very soon after, there's resistance. And the communist party, you know, you could say they were very naive in the way that they pursued their policy. So they did widespread land reform and expected people to to go along with it. But of course, uh, they were upsetting these uh, very old uh, structures of ownership and sharing. And the results were pretty disastrous because you alienated all these people who had had some kind of purchase on uh, some land ownership before, but you also disrupted all the agricultural um, systems that were based on uh, sharing of water, because water is very scarce. Sharing of water and sharing of resources and sharing of animals um, uh, in order to get the work done. And uh, as soon as you you put people in opposition by disrupting all of the uh, by disrupting on ownership that have been there for a long time, then you know in a way I really sympathize with that because they were. Uh, trying to um, move past a feudal system that was really outdated. And, and, um, but at the same time, um, I think that the way that they pursued that uh, is, um, was, uh, was part of the reason why the uprising happened so swiftly. And then in 79, after being requested by the Afghan government several times, the communist government several times to intervene, the Soviets finally um, sent... Um, their forces and yeah, then it was widespread invasion. And from that point, it went from bad to worse. And uh, this was full scale war. Um, so yeah, things quickly became intolerable for most people in right. living. You know. And we'll, we'll get a taste of this right now. Uh, <clears throat> share screen. درست 23 فوریه 1980 درست یک ماه یک ماه و چند روز بعد از آمدن قوای شوروی در افغانستان مردم کابل قیام کردند شب و هنگام به بامای خود بیرون می شدن و صدای الله اکبر می کشیدن و در مجموع ما میتونیم که چگونه دست دست مردم به زندان بیرن
زندان پلچرخی یکی از اون زندان هایی بود که برای آدم های سیاسی دیگه ای جای نمانده بود این زمان زیادتر طرف تشنج نزدیک شده می رفت خاطر که در پشت وزارت داخلی افغانستان لست های بند می شد که اونا دیگه نباید کس پشتشان بگرده اینا کشته شدن و شما باور بکنین که من به چشم خود که ها زن دیدم که وقتی نام بچه خدا وقتی نام شوهر خدا در اون لستان میخوندن زوف میکنن اونا بازگیریه کنن و برن و سر بگیم چه همون جای به جای زوف میکنن و این واقعه هر روز تکرار میشد در پشت وزارت داخله revolution and as indicative of unshakable unity. در آغاز انقلاب انوز مجاهدین بسیج نشده بودن انوز مردم نمی فهمیدن که چی گپ میشه گروپ های بسیار زیاد کوچک کوچک ایجاد شد در شهرها در ولایات در قرا و قصبات اینا و اینا اما اندیشه که باید ضد خارجی بجنگند ای هر روز روز به روز بسیجتر شده میرفت رهبرا رفتن پاکستان از اونجا اسلحه صادر میکردن کتی از اون مجاهدین جنگ میکردن بخیر بری و بخیر بری آمین الله اکبر الله اکبر الله اکبر جلی توحید خود فرقی ستم گرمش کنم بنیاد زالم بر کنم سردار سرور بش کنم بنیاد زالم بر کنم سردار سرور بش کنم ما تولد ما در پنشیر شده دیگه شاید در حدود سه ساله بودم که فامیلی رفتیم کابل نظر به مشکلاتی که ما در رژیم کمونیستی پیدا کردم که چون دو تا برادر ما مجاهد بودن یا کمونیستای ادلاعات و دست می آوردن که همکاری میکنه و او خانواده را تبدید میکردن میگرفتن به زندان منداختن که روسا در افغانستان بودن ما از مکتب از سن فشت راها کردم و رفتم در صف مجایدی Okay, I'm going to stop it there because it's a good place to stop. Um, so there's 14 years of this, that what we, 14 years of organizing small groups of Mujahideen. Um, uh, and how much of this is shared by the people in the cities and the towns? And uh, how, how much of this is, is, do people realize that this is going on in Afghanistan? Sure. Well, I mean, it, it's going on. I mean, the the as he says, like the the organizing started out very grassroots at first, right? And what happened over time is that there emerged um, a number of prominent uh, leaders and prominent uh, groups, and many of them were people who had had power before, and some were newer leaders, younger people who were very um, enthusiastic in the cause of um, uh, jihad. And this is, by the way, the the in many ways the origin of international jihad is this war. Um, so the jihadis that you hear about today, they owe their roots to the American funded uh, insurgency against uh, the Soviets. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, in America funding these, these, these leaders who, who emerged, they, um, they were not thinking so much about 
how uh, skillful or, or compassionate these people would be as leaders once they defeated the Soviets, right? They were thinking about uh, who's going to be the worst enemy for the Soviets that we can finance. And so they financed some very um, uh, extreme characters like um, Gulbuddin Hekmatyar, who uh, had already been known for splashing acid in uh, schoolgirls' faces before that. So, um, you know, these are the type of people that they were happy to finance as, as, uh, as leaders in their uh, insurgency, uh, their, their, their covert war, right? But um, from an Afghan perspective, I think it was a very genuine uprising as well, uh, although it was, um, I think, um, subverted in many ways to serve uh, other, other larger powers. Um, and, um, and what ended up happening was that there were seven major uh, Mujahideen parties that were based um, in, and what they did was they, they, they created these offices in Pakistan through which they could receive aid from the US and from uh, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan administered that aid uh, to a large extent. And, and so Pakistan became also very rich from this war in the sense that they were able to um, be the source of weapons, et cetera, for these, for these, uh, for these groups. And, um, you know, there's well-documented uh, also corruption in, in that war. So, you know, very early on, Pakistan began to uh, profit from the fact that there was war and conflict in Afghanistan, which I think, you know, has been many times pointed out as one of many factors that um, unfortunately is, is conducive to continued conflict rather than to an end of conflict. But um, I would say... Um, that yes, everybody knew what was happening in Afghanistan. And in fact, in the cities, there were networks of Mujahideen. So, and this is part of our story because one of the most prominent Mujahideen leaders, uh, at least one of the most famous outside of Afghanistan was Ahmed Shah Massoud, who was this um, uh, very charismatic leader from um, Panjshir Valley, which at the time was not a province of its own, but, um, and just a valley, um, uh, you know, not too far from the capital. And that valley, it's a very beautiful place. I've been there many times. Mm -hmm. and, and when you go up, it's just dramatic winding uh, mountain roads and deep, deep um, valleys that are beautifully ir irrigated and, and farmed. And, um, and because of the mountainous nature of that area and how enclosed it is, it, um, it's very easy to defend. And so, um, you know, that became, because it's close to the capital, it became this very important stronghold for the resistance. Now, um, Masood also was a very skillful militarily and very charismatic leader who was able to gather a lot of people around him. Um, and he had networks inside the cities and um, as did other parties. But for the purposes of our story, um, you know, this is one of the reasons why uh, there was suspicion against Panjshiri people who were living inside Kabul because, because Masood's networks were so effective. And so he was able to sabotage um, the communist regime by using people who were in the capital. So, um, so people began more and more to be seen with suspicion if they were from that part of the country. And many people then fled and joined the resistance because they no longer had a way to participate in communist life. So um, yes, it was really wide, widely known. And of course, though, in the capital, the communist government um, tried to continue to have a thriving you know, city. And to some extent, they really succeeded. I mean, the most successful was Najibullah, who is the, the, um, the final president of Afghanistan uh, during that period, who was able to really have a very well-run city to the point where people still put his picture up in, in Kabul and, and uh, well, before the 15th of August, and, and used to say, you know, he really knew how to, Dr. Najib really knew how to run the country. You, you know, the garbage was always picked up on time, like yeah, everything was ran properly and very skillful too, because he managed to um, stay in power and continue to keep this communist government running for years after the Soviet Red Army left Afghanistan. So they left in 89. Um, and left behind this, this, you know, Kabul, which was ruled uh, by Dr. Najib, by the communists, and they continued to give aid, enough aid, so that he was able to actually defend the city as a kind of fortress and make allies, enough allies to keep his enemies in disarray. And so um, that lasted until 1992, which you guys know in 1992 was the end of the Soviet Union, and there was no more aid coming. And so uh, at that point, the communist regime collapsed uh, under the pressure of uh, 
the Mujahideen forces. And I'm just going to show that what comes next at that point. و خواهی نخواهی یک اتفاق میفته یکی از بهترین روزای ما بود ما همیشه دهی فکر بودیم که حالا شاید این تصویر ها را فلم برداری کنیم این سهم ها امروز معرف پنج سو شورای رهبری جهادی تشکیل جلسه فوقلاده داده و این سلب عمل آورده جهاد که چهارده سال یک جنگ دوام میکنه بعد از چهارده سال مجایدین میتوانند که کابل افتاده کنند و او را نیروهای میتوانند کابل افتاده کنند که مربوط ما میشه و فرماندی آمر صاحب ای با ما بسیار خوشایند بود و یکی از روزهای بسیار تاریخی ما بود روزهای بس دشوار بود که زمانی که حکومت استاد ربانی بود و یکی از خاطرات بسیار فراموش نشدنی من در زندگی می بود که من امرای آمر سای ملاقات کردم مرا گفت که تو همیشه کار کو در سینما هیچ گونه مشکلی نخواد داشتی ولی گفت که یک چیز برات میگم که تا شش ماه وضعیت کابل بسیار زیاد خراب میشه و هیچ کس کس را تضمین کردن نمیتانه و ما برای توی اجازه میتونم که برای شش ماه بیرو برو ولی شش ماه باید افضار تغییر میکنه در کابل پس بیا باید به کارت شروع کن و حتی دمو جدوی فکر بودیم که وقتی که کابل میریم بخیر تحصیل ما پس مانده ادامه بتیم اون را درس کنیم اما هیچ نمیفهمیدیم که ما در کابل میریم حتی روزی در جنگ هم بود که جنگ هایی که در کابل بین نیروهای حکمتیار و نیروهای دولت مجاهدین اتفاق افتاد کم کم وسط پیدا کرد و قسم شد که بخشی از شهر کابلا را ایران شد روکتزنی هایی که در داخل شهر می شد فرار مردم بسیار سانه تراجیدی بود یک ملد یک مردم آرام یک دفعه در این تیگه وزید بستن بسیار زیاد دلهوره داشتم که عرض اتفاق بفته که شرایط بیخی دیگر گون شد و یک روز نفکرم فلم راکت خورده بود شیشه ها ریخته بود همه چیز و اونجا دیگه از ما امیدم واقعا راست بگویم که امیدم کنده شد جنگ های تابستان وقت شروع شد بسیاری از سینماگر ها باید بوشتن که از کشورشان فرار بکنند هنر پیشه های زن از افغانستان به جز از یاسمین یارمل که بزار شریف رفت از اون جمله انجینیر سب لطیف حتی باید بوش شد افغان فلم رها بکنه و گی باید باسکان رفت و افغان فلم بی سر روش کن سپتامبر دوزده سال نوازدون رئیس افغان فلم موظف شد ولی ما یک مقدار ناراحت بودم نگران بودم مجاهدین بسیاری هایش مخالف سینما خود بودن شاید آتا کش کنن که دروازه سینما ها بسته شد بعضی از مجاهدین مخالف زن ها بودن که در تلویزیون ها نبراین گفتن اگر یک بار دیگه زن ها در صفحه تلویزیون پیدا شوند ما با راکت کابل نابود میکنیم و یا اگر دروازه سینما ها باز شوند باز ما جوی های خون در کابل روان خواهد شد آنس به عنوان رئیس افغان فلم مهم بود این بود که ما یک آرشیف داشتیم 
که در او تعداد زیادی از فیلم های قرار داشت که میتونست روایت تصویری تاریخ افغانستان باشه ولی ما چگونه میتونستیم در حال که جنگ بود نبود برق بود نبود پول و امکانات بود یا شیف نگاه بود و این کار شد خوشبختانه ما یک جنراتور قیده بود که روزانه حداقل میتونست هوای درون افغان فلم سرد نگاه بکنه تا آشیف از بین بر و که زندگی سینما خاتمه پیدا نکنه با جنگ ما یادم میاد که بیشترین تماشاچی ها رو با در سینما با اونجی که جنگ بود با اونجی که هر لحظه شهر با راکت تخریب میشد و ایران میشد کشتار بود بله بله It just keeps coming. <laughs> yeah, and by the way, in that those last images there, in um, the I guess penultimate images there, where you see them shooting out the windows, they're in uh, Cinema Pamir. They're in Pamir Cinema downtown. In, in oh, Kabul, really? Broken into the cinema, and uh, yeah, and so they're using it as a a base. Um, so, uh, by the way, all the images we are seeing were taken from the Afghan film archives, everything we've seen. And uh, well, th th there's also the filming with Masood and, and the Mujahideen, but those That's are right. your two principal, those are your main sources. Those are sources. the two sources. Those are the two sources that we use. And um, the only other source is um, we did create some recreations that um, illustrate some of the more personal moments of some of the filmmakers. But those are kind of coded into the, because you know, those you'll see them, they're widescreen. Those are 16.9, whereas the, almost every one of the other shots is uh, 4.3. So um, they have that more square aspect ratio. So you can kind of see when you see widescreen that it's a little clue that it might be a, a recreation. Right. So. And I love the way, I, I don't know if people have noticed this, how you keep threading through the act of, of, of the, the archive itself and digitizing and, and the fact of taking care of this because it, you always come back to the fact that this is about film. It's yes, all the guns are going there, you know, and, and people are organizing and people are being brought to prison and everything. But then there is the film, the film, it's a story within a story. It's, it's, it's very well done. Before we go, I, I always have more questions. We have more segments. Are there any other qu questions at this point? Anyone? No? Um, so I have a question. Um, like it's been 14 years of Mujahideen organizing. They finally take Kabul after 14 years the principal group of Masood takes Kabul. Where is the Taliban? I mean, the Taliban is, 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 is part of this, isn't it? Somewhere, uh, it's part of one of the groups, is it? Uh, well, not yet. It hadn't been really uh, surfaced yet. But yes, I mean, the, some of the presidents of the Taliban were there. There were fighters who called themselves Taliban who were um, uh, educated in the um, uh, madrasas on the border of uh, Pakistan and, and, and Afghanistan. And, um, you know, this was encouraged as well by the US and Saudi Arabia who were also financing this fight. And um, to the point where um, there were actually uh, US uh, created and donated um, uh, educational materials. Very famously, uh, one of them had a 
an English alphabet in it in which K was for Kalashnikov and etc. So teaching children uh, integrating this type of violence right into their education in order to make them more fearsome enemies of the uh, enemies of America. Mm. But, um, you know, so these these students who were trained in, in these madrasas who um, were were uh, a little bit different than the uh, this sort of more um, typical what you imagine with the Mujahideen, which is uh, an Afghan villager who came from a village that was affected by the war and had some métier or was a farmer and then joined. So these were younger people who um, were joining right out of this madrasa. So they could have been teenagers in early 20s. And, you know, so this is a different kind of demographic and a different phenomenon. But um, it wasn't the Taliban as a separate entity with aspirations to rule the country until um, the end of the civil war period. So what happened uh, after the Mujahideen won is that they then, of course, uh, tore the country apart. Not of course, but sadly, they, 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 they uh, became engaged in a power struggle. And um, the different groups of the different groups. Different. That's right. Different groups of Mujahideen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and so out of this context of years, uh, four years of um, nearly four years of this type of no stable government, uh, many armed groups that are uh, robbing people on the road, kidnapping uh, women and young boys for sex, uh, these kinds of behaviors are just completely out of control uh, to live in, in that time would have been nearly impossible. And then you have the Taliban coming out of that context. So that's the context in which the Taliban, the Taliban rises. Okay, so I, I was asking because one thing that strikes you in, in the archives or the, the segment about the Mujahideen is the the Islamic, you know, r rigor, uh, you know, they, about no more women on TV, bloods will flow in the streets, which we associate with the Taliban, right? So is this in reaction to... Um, is this in reaction, uh, the Mujahideen feels it needs to be the, this religious in reaction to the communist regime or because the Afghanistan you've shown us before, dancing and flowing and modern and intellectual and everything is not on that wavelength. So uh, so how, where does it come from? So yes, so yes, exactly, Francine. I, I, in parallel to these leftist movements, and these pro-West sort of modernist movements that were happening in Kabul in the 60s and 70s, there were Islamist movements. There were um, also Islamist movements. So that uh, was, a par was parallel. They were all happening at the same time. And, um, you know, but there were winners and losers, right? So at first it was really the monarchy uh, that, that was the winner and, and with the, um, with the with the coup d'état in 1974 with um, uh, Daoud Khan again, it was really somebody who came out of the monarchy trying to make a show of making a democracy, but it was really it was really a continuation of the monarchy period. But then um, in 78, with the rise of the communists, it was this leftist uh, faction that won, at least uh, ostensibly. And really, the opposite end of the uh, ideological spectrum was the Islamists, and those are the the people who you know, basically were empowered to fight uh, against the uh, communism there and against the Soviet Red Army. Um, and by empowering them, um, you know, a monster really was created. I mean, to put it in this most simplistic terms, um, you know, the, the, the Western powers and, and other powers that, that uh, including Saudi Arabia, that, that supported these fighters in, uh, out of a desire to defeat the Soviets and embroiled the Soviets. And I mean, there was no sense in which, you know, there was there that the US was hoping this war would end quickly. I mean, this was the, they called it the Soviet bear trap. They called it the bear trap, right? It was, it was, uh, they were going to give the Soviets their own taste of, of what Vietnam was like, right? Embroiled them in a war mm -hmm. that would go on endlessly, with, of course, very little concern for the people who would be uh, whose lives would be destroyed as a result. And so, yeah, this kind of called real politic calculation. But, um, you know, the, so that the people that were empowered um, to fight against the Soviets were these Islamists who had predated, um, you know, the war, but who were really empowered to recruit and enlarge their networks and become powerful 
uh, through this war. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, hopefully, did that answer your question? Absolutely. And so here comes the Taliban. So here comes the Taliban. And if you talk to some, I've spoken to people in Kabul, older people in Kabul who lived through all this, who have said to me, you know what, Mujahideen, Taliban, it's the same, same donkey with a different saddle. Yeah, the, you get that feeling. But it gets even, it gets darker. Stay tuned, folks. Here we go. Well, okay. Um, بسیار یک تاریخ تاریک در افغانستان رقم خورد که او دوره طالبا بود او تو خانواده را ما در افغانستان سراغ نداریم که آسیب پذیر نشده باشه و از او جمله یک شما بودم وقتی که در مزار شریف طالبا آمد می گفتم کس خبر نشه که مثلا ما در یک قریه هستم که اگر بفهم من که من یک هنرمند هستم و دقیق قریه هستم دیگه بر من زندگی ناممکن است چادری می پوشیدم و برای کس خود معرفی نمی کردم کسایی که اقارب شوهرم بودن اونا مرا مشناختن ولی کسایی که نمشناختن بر از نوخت ارگس معرفی نمی کردم و یک امکان داشت که اگر مرا پیدا کنن دیگه نذارن که من زنده بمونم ما در اونجا مجبورن نام خدا تغییر دادم و نام خدا گذاشتم صالح و همه ای مرا به نام صالح گذاشتم یک روز ما افغان فلم رفتم یکی از بچه های افغان فلم آمد گفت که برمکس یک طالب آمده و شما را کار دارم تا او یک پک گفت من فامیدم که تصمیم است که مرا دستگیر بکنن مرا گفتم که با پشو پرسیدن که خود رئیس افغان فلم است و من شان گفتم بله گفت که بس پنشیر است و من گفتم با از پنشیر است گفت سلا داری؟ گفتم شاید اولین پنشیری باشم گفتم سلا ندارم گلم ساز استی ما با فلم بسازم کامپر استی دیگه آمدن خانه مادرم تنها بود به خانه تا مرا با طالبا دید مادرم تقریبا مثل که زوف کرده باشه میفهمید که شاید اتفاق بفته و خب مادرم با او شاردم و این طالبا شروع کردن با جستجو و خب هرچی که یک پروژیکتور 8 میلیمتر فلم کمری 8 میلیمتری فلم یک موویلای همیشه تکه تکه کردن یکیش میخواست مرا ببرم میگفت که حرف شی بود که باید قندار فرستاده شد ولی یکیش نیفهم چی اتفاق افتاده بود در دلش میگفت که من میگم که امی صدیق برمک رها کن و مرا رها کردند امی که ازشون نجات پیدا کردم آمدم مادرم شانه گفتم که باید بریم راهی بود از کابل به طرف پاکستان و من که دو ماه اونجا بودم بعد از اونجا باز دوباره تصمیم گرفتم پس دوباره افغانستان به اون پنج شهر. درست تاریخ 8 نو ده یازده مارچ بود که خبرهای پخش بشد از اینکه طالبا مجسمه ها و پیکره های بودا را در بامیان از بین میبرند و, و بالاخره در تاریخ یازده کاملا منفجرشان ساختند تاریخ یازده مارچ همون روز یا چهار روز بعدش یک نامه از افغان فلم یک دوست سید مصطفی آقا که مسئول بخش لابراتوار بود یک نامه روان کرد و گفت روزگار ما سیاه است برمک جان قرار است که یک حیط پاکستانی یک حیط طالبا از وزارت اطلاعات و فرهنگ طالبا 
آرشیف افغان فیلم بیان و نابود بسازن و ما دیگه واقعا دلهوره ما بسیار زیاد شده بود فقط آنچه که اتفاق مفتاد این بود که از خدا میخواستیم که یک کاری شد که اتفاق نفت دارید So, we arrive to the climax, um, the destruction, the near destruction um, uh, of the Afghan film archives. Um, in fact, we didn't really talk about this, Ariel, yet, but this is at the center of your whole, at the fi- of your film. You know this. You know when you set out to start filming this, that this is, that this is the... The, 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 the hidden, the, the, the thing that almost happened, right? The tragedy that was, that was avoided. Mm-hmm. That's true, yeah. Yeah, this, um, this, this attempt on the part of this, um, you know, band of uh, uh, vigilantes, really, uh, iconoclastic vigilantes who were destroying as much uh, culture as they could in the name of Islam because of um, Islam's uh, prohibition against creating idols. Um, so using this as a justification to destroy these things that had existed in Afghanistan with no problems, you know, uh, with Islam for, 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 you know, a thousand years, like the Buddhists of, of Bamiyan, for example. And they came to burn the films. And um, fortunately, the filmmakers, um, the day before, were tipped off by this man, um, Is- um, Isaac Nesami, who, who is a Uh, a Taliban official, and he he knew that this band of of uh, vigilantes was coming, and he he told them um, hide the films, and you have my permission to do so. And so they did. They hid the films. They built a false wall. They um, they they obscured what they were doing, and they they gave to this band of vigilantes who wanted to burn something. They knew they needed to burn something, so they gave them film prints that had come from Soviet and American films, Hollywood films, and, and, and Russian films, and and they burned those, uh, thinking that they were burning, you know, the entire uh, archive. And uh, yeah, that that is an amazing part of the story. I mean, it just gets better and better. I mean, there's always. But uh, what we're going to see now, which is essentially that that the, the denouement here, you filmed uh, af- you filmed much after the fact. Is that it? You, this is you filmed that in when you were filming all the other stuff. This is not film archives, right? That's your own film. Oh, we, I'm not sure which part you're referring. Uh, well, to. I'll, okay, I'll show it and then we'll talk about it. Okay, <laughs> it's easier that way. Um, موجود <laughs> ایساق نظامی نموجو آمد گفت که امی چیزی که فیلم را که شما میخواهید خودتان میفهمید این فیلم شما جای به جای کنی هر جایی که جای به جای میکنی از طرف ما اجازه است بعد از این آدم رای خود گرفت را برا من ولی چیزی را که از ولی بازم در بین طالب ها انسان های وجود داشت که به خاطر تاریخش و وطنش دلش می تبید اونمو آدم ها بودن که آرشیف نشد نه کسایی که در اینجا کار میکرد اونا کسایی بودن که در فیزیکی عمل را انجام دادن ولی پشتیبان معنوی در بالا جایه ها داشتن 
دکتر بود که در رادیو پیام تکرار میشد ولی از همه مهمتر همین بود so that's so that section is all real footage that's right. that's Hisaki Nizami who who actually is this Taliban uh, I mean, ex official that is the real kicker of the film you know like it's it's a real poof. how did you find this guy oh um well i i have been hearing this story francine about the um the archive being burned for so many years and i knew it wasn't complete you know i just knew that there was something missing from it because there were little inconsistencies that didn't make sense to me and so i pushed a little harder and went a little deeper and uh, just asked everybody their individual version and and eventually through just through a, um you know repeating this process of of trying to get deeper into the story i i started to get this hint that there was somebody else and then it turned out it was a taliban official and then i eventually got his name and then together with um a very dear friend and colleague of mine salim yusuf zada we tracked him down in kabul and um were able to uh invite him he hadn't been back to the archive uh since and um you know so people were just so ecstatic to see him and gave him a hero's welcome and i just found it so touching for me to see that because again here cinema is transcending these uh differences in ideology you couldn't get more different of the taliban ourselves. like who who would have guessed um, yeah yeah I, and but it also does bring home the point that some of these oppositions are so hard in in um in also in the way they're portrayed in the media right because there isn't there isn't always a lot of room for complexity and so that's what we do right that's 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 what documentary is for so being able to bring that little bit of complexity was something i wanted to do so are you saying that until this film it was not yeah. widely known that uh, this man taliban official had saved surreptitiously the archive film archives It had, as far as I know, it had never been written. I mean, I I had seen many written accounts, including on the BBC, about this the films being burned. But it was always a story, and oftentimes they were really wrong. I mean, totally factually incorrect. I mean, the first one I read said that uh, Latif had saved the films, but I knew for a fact that he hadn't been in the country during the entire Taliban period. So I knew that wasn't true, and um, you know, so uh, yeah, this was the first time that this was. um it was revealed it was a, it felt good it's like a little little um little journalistic moment you investigative know, journalism on, death, <laughs> on top of everything else yeah. that's wonderful so i we're going to go to the conclusion and then we'll open it up and hopefully start preparing your questions folks um this is um uh, this is uh, miriam again ايه ده جاب السعر مهم شويه بس طب سابقا شو بت درد درد سرزمین خود ما رخت سخار کرد well i think afghanistan is at a stage now where pieces of its history are starting to resurface into the sayable from the unspeakable when you're coming out of a period of intense conflict there are parts of the past that are untouchable and then gradually 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 they become things that you can look at and speak about again so i think you know we're emerging into a period in afghanistan where it's now becoming possible again to talk about the communist period with some kind of uh some kind of honesty and and uh, completeness that that was not possible even 5 years ago um and certainly not 10 years ago um but for example we still can't talk about the mujahideen period that way and we certainly can't talk about the taliban years that way yet um they're too close still um but i think you know archives are incredibly important for that reason because in an archive you sort of can seal off these histories uh and and keep them until the moment when it's safe to look at them again
Great stuff, really wonderful stuff. Um, well, I always have a million questions, but I'm gonna uh, take questions. We're gonna take questions from the floor. Um, who has a question for Ariel? There's so much to talk about. I had a question. Yeah. Um, hi, Ariel. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to know, like, as uh, you spoke about it a little bit before, but as um, as someone making films about like your own kind of culture and your own history, um, did you find yourself having to like kind of unlearn the kind of tropes and stuff that are in the media here in, in Canada? Cause I'm guessing like, even though you did have that access to your dad and your family, like I guess like as a younger person first getting into like filmmaking and that kind of stuff, you're not impervious to like the surrounding messages. So like, what was that like? Kind of, like unprogram your mind of how to represent like the Afghan experience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's true um, to a certain extent. I mean, I think I'd always been kind of critical um, about my, I was kind of raised in a kind of alternative fa type family. You know, my parents were, they were hippies in the 60s and they were new age in the 70s. And then, you know, they were just kind of contrarian after that. So I kind of like knew that the media wasn't necessarily telling you. <laughs> Couldn't be truth. trusted. But yeah. And, you know, and I'd had a chance to kind of compare the stories of my family to what I was hearing from the outside. But I also just knew, like, I just knew from what people said that, that there were so many stereotypes. But but you're right. I mean, uh, there were a lot of surprises for me. And um, I mean, the first time I landed in Kabul, I actually got knocked down by uh, right after walking off the plane. I got knocked down by the rear jets of a 737 on the runway. And so, like, my first introduction to... Afghanistan was getting like flattened onto the ground. Um, the airport at that time was still coming together and um, there it was still covered in a lot of broken planes. And um, so, you know, they just didn't have the traffic control <laughs> that was necessary to prevent that kind of mishap from happening. But, you know, so I went and I, I remember just, you know, honestly, it was so shocking to be there for the first time that I think it, all my preconceptions got blown out the other side of my head, you know, like it was just so like different from, you know, anything I could have anticipated, you know, but at the same time, people were very friendly and people were very, very, so, you know, honestly, in my family, I have been, I have been really warned that this would be really dangerous to go and I shouldn't go. And even my dad didn't want me to go, you know, and my sister um, kind of freaked out and wrote a letter, open letter to like, we're a pretty big family. She wrote a letter to everyone, emailed it that said something about how like, if I went, it would like destroy the whole family and drag us all down because I probably be killed over there and blah, 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 and that we should be considering physically restraining me from going to the airport. And it was just like, just kind of, she kind of, you know, she kind of lost it. But um, so I guess, you know, I was, I, every single time, this is, all, this is coming back to me now. And every single time after that first time, every single time I would go to Afghanistan, I would have been back here in between, back in Canada in between, and I would be watching the news, you know, and I would get scared again, you know, and then I would go there and it would be fine. And then I would, you know, it's not that it was totally fine. I did experience several suicide bombings, actually, that did leave their trace on me, for sure. But, um, but in general, I, I was fine. I would be fine for months at a time, you know? So I would go and then I would go home and I would look at the news and it would be like, oh my God, you can't even walk down the streets, you know? And then I would go there and it would be fine. So um, yeah, I almost had to relearn it every single time I went back. In fact, I remember one time, um, I think it was in 2007. So I'd been the one time and I was going back again in 2007. I knew that things had gotten a little bit uh, more violent. 
and I had this, and I was feeling nervous. And just by chance, I had this taxi driver who was Afghan and who was just told me like, look, it's not too late. Like I can just drive you back home. Like you really shouldn't go. Like you'll be raped, you'll be killed, you'll be raped again. Like you're like, and this is the Afghan guy, right? So I was kind of like, like, but I didn't listen to him and I went and everything was fine. It wasn't raped and I was fine. But, um, you know, that's, I mean, that's basically every time I ever in between, I had to like, I got scared again and then I would go back. I mean, for, for the first few times. And after that, I stopped listening and I started just, you know, I had too many connections there to really let that permeate me. But yeah, I mean, the whole time I was listening to the news and, and feeling that, you know, there was so much inaccuracy and really feeling depressed about it. I mean, I think in some ways, you know, as many as, as much as there are many good journalists and many great journalists and good journalists can make such a difference in the world. I think journalism overall is really failing us. I hate to say it, but, um, you know, I think it failed us on Afghanistan. People weren't, weren't really able to get good information if they didn't know the difference. And I think it's failing us on the environment. I think it's failing us in massive ways. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, that was something that really hit home for me in Afghanistan. And I could give you many examples, but it just became very clear that the media wasn't telling the truth. So, yeah, just do that. Um, uh, any other questions about anything, about how the film was made, uh, about the, the, the history behind it, the, the events behind it, the characters, anything at all? Nanor, do you have another question? Or, and you seem like you have a question there. No? Nothing no. else. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask that, why did you decide to end the uh, documentary with the song and not a concrete statement or just music? Because I think, and for me also, like, how did you just before making the documentary, before starting the process, did you finalize the ending or is it something that you uh, figured out in the process? Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, we, we figured it out in the process. But basically, um, the reason why, you know, I used the that material, you know, to, to be honest, the song was was not the primary thing that we that 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 that, you know, that I've that led the decision The what led the decision was to use that shot, actually, those that that scene of this family um going trying to escape and it's and it's a story this this is a story of a family trying to escape afghanistan during the soviet afghan war and they're there this is a very widespread experience many many people many many actually millions of afghan refugees experienced this um you know before syria you know before iraq afghanistan was the at the time the biggest refugee crisis in the world and um there were there were millions of Afghans outside of their country, and so millions of people experienced this this terrifying thing of having to leave everything behind, um, putting themselves at risk of being robbed, uh, and and traveling across a country that was at war, and where you would walk through from the stories I've heard from family members, and you would walk you would walk past uh, dead bodies, you would walk through villages that had been bombed and were completely abandoned. I mean, it's just a nightmare landscape, and so I felt that this this um, this is very important, right? Because there's so much conflict and there's so much um, uh, this that this experience of having to move and being displaced has become um, really uh, a major part of the really Afghan experience. I think not just in Afghanistan, but for the massive diaspora that exists outside of Afghanistan as well, a couple million Afghans. So um, I wanted to use this shot because I wanted it to to, to end with that image, you know, that we're still kind of lost in this wilderness of, um, uh, of, of conflict and, um, and confusion and, and trying to find our way. And, and um, you know, I mean, for me, uh, the preservation of this archive speaks to some kind of, in some small way, um, healing the memory of a place that has been so traumatized that every form of memory that it has is kind of fragmented and fractured. And so to try and put that back into a narrative for me was like, it was a, it was a healing process for me to do in terms of like 
I didn't go through that, but I but I experienced the intergenerational trauma of having family that went through that and kind of having this awareness of having a homeland that you know was so unstable and so deeply embroiled in conflict. And so for me, that that was the only image I could end the film with because I didn't want to end on a happy note. I didn't want to end on you know a note of absolute despair either. But I wanted to show you know that somehow we're still we're still um, kind of walking through this 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 fog you know this sandstorm that's we can't see too far ahead and um we're a bit lost but we're finding our way you know pushing through all of these forces to try and get to a place of uh healing and safety so that's that was the idea um and um that's why we put that shot there okay are there any other questions i mean you uh... Uh, no, yes. Francine, I could also talk to your, I could also talk about, um, I could do some outreach if people are interested. Um, would you like me to do that with the remaining time? I mean, I'm always looking to use these opportunities also to do some outreach from the NFB to what tell people mean? a little bit about how they could work with the NFB. Uh, okay, well, I just have an, I always have, question so okay. i have a last question and then I, i'll please by all means outreach um so I, well I, I must say that after showing uh, seeing your film and I, I we will be posting the link uh to the uh, to the film so that you can see it all it's worth watching more than once there's so much stuff in it the way it's constructed is a, is 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 really for film students is really interested but also for history students for you know anyone interested in, in Afghanistan or, 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 or the love of film is, is a wonderful, it's a wonderful film to look at. Uh, I love, I wish I could have shown some of Akbar by the way, but um, anyways, um, I like it gives you the fact, watching your film gives me anyways, the, for the first time since the, the last upheaval has happened. And of course you didn't ever get there, but in August, we know what happened. The Americans left and the Taliban took over. Um, it, it's part, we feel now that, well, they might get through this one too, you know, like it's been, there's been so much and there's every time there is a silver lining which you have shown and it's the brilliance of your film. And that's why I titled, you know, look for the gold amongst the rubble. Uh, you show the silver lining, you show what's worth keeping and, and you know, the, that, you know, we are resilient, creative human beings ultimately. And it's true everywhere, you know. And it and, and in that it's a great it's a great homage to to your to Afghanistan, but also to that part of of, uh, of humanity. Are you uh, my 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 question is how you? I guess you're not, especially after your comment on the media. You weren't surprised what happened, what's happening in in Afghanistan, or were well, you? I mean, some things are surprising and some things are unsurprising. It was definitely surprising how quickly. Um, the Taliban were able to take over the entire country. I mean, uh, this was, su was pretty surprising. Yeah. But um, I think I was probably less surprised than some people were um, uh, because of some of the context that I have about the Afghan military uh, that surrendered to the Taliban. Um, I think that uh, I was unsurprised that the Taliban ended up in power. In fact, what I was really surprised at what, what surprised me and probably maybe shouldn't have, but what shocked me was uh, when uh, the US began to pursue a peace agreement with the Taliban. That shocked me because at that point, all of this was pretty much, um, I, I think, uh, predictable in a certain sense. Not, not the exact way it happened. I mean, no one could foresee that, but the um, legitimizing the uh, Taliban that way when they already had the upper hand militarily I had zero to lose from this peace deal. It was mm -hmm. an absolute act of uh, surrender and betrayal and hypocrisy mm -hmm. that was so um, antithetical to everything that they had said and everything that they had done and the way that they had behaved and the way that they had their stance and posture before that, that, um, you know, I mean, look, at least in Canada, I mean, and, and elsewhere, the war was justified based on, um, largely based on human rights, right? And the biggest, element of that was women's rights, right? Mm -hmm. So we were there 
And this was, look, I remember very clearly because I was part of the debates on the radio and et cetera. And, and it was, the debates were about, are we helping the women in Afghanistan? This was the main uh, way that, uh, that, that I think NATO governments helped to keep their, um, their, 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 their constituencies, their public, um, you know, uh, accepting the war. But so, so what happens when you decide that you're, you're going to make a peace deal and you're going to do that because you're losing, right? It's not, there's no other reason. What does that say about the value of human rights? Like, what does that say about our commitment to human rights? What is it? What, so we, we just like, we, it cost too much. So that's it. So we're going to go, so we're going to do peace. I mean, it made absolutely no sense. It was completely unjustifiable. It totally undermined the Afghan government that had been the allies of the internationals. And um, it was just completely anti-rational, you know? So it, it's to expect people to swallow that without really much explanation other than peace is good, war is bad. You know, it's just, uh, okay, so you don't give a shit. You don't care what people think. You don't care about the fact that you're, you're reversing your idea. Your ideology is less important to you than your politics, your electoral politics and, and saving money. So it, it just, it, it, you cannot make change in a country with that kind of uh, result, you know? And so, and especially in this situation, which was incredibly difficult. Um, now, like, could there have been a different outcome? Absolutely. I mean, early on in the war, I mean, there was so much openness. There was so much openness to the West. There was so much openness to change. There was, people were welcoming um, this kind of uh, change and this shift and hopefully democracy, right? But, and and democracy in some ways was a, was a success in Afghanistan. I mean, people embraced it and people brought their own uh, stuff to it. I mean, there was like 120 political party, parties at the time I was living in Afghanistan. And they all took themselves seriously they were debating seriously there were candidates from many different part parties it was very pluralistic it was very interesting women were being elected um actually it had actually the parliament had one of the highest uh, uh ratio of women to men in the entire world but that's mm. because they actually in their constitution had 25 percent uh, mandatory uh, seats for women which is actually higher than most of the world west and east but um the the thing is that um I think the overall thing was predictable. Uh, and I think that the war was run mostly for profit because um, when you think about things that could have been done to disrupt the Taliban regime, to disrupt the Taliban, sorry, uh, insurgency, uh, the things that could have been done to improve life for Afghans and for people outside of Afghanistan that weren't done, it's, it's a little bit difficult to understand. It, it, it's so, um, it so defies reason the failures of, of this war, the laziness of thinking, the mm -hmm. waste of money, uh, it so defies all reason. I mean, more effort was put into uh, writing about Afghanistan than I think into making Afghan policy, honestly, because I mean, it was just so slapdash and lazy and disgusting and such a waste um, to observe that on the ground um, that, uh, yeah, I don't know that there ever would, would have been a good outcome. I think Christine has a question. Christine? Yeah, yes, just please. unmuting myself. Do you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, sorry, I don't come from a film background. I, I come from a news background, so it's more of, um, you know, photos. Um, I am curious, though, and I haven't seen the film either. Um, has the film been seen in Afghanistan, and how was it received? Yeah, 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 yeah. We had the opportunity to show it um, twice in Afghanistan before we premiered it in Amsterdam. Um, and... Uh, we showed it once in the Afghan Films building, uh, where they have their own screening room, and um, you know, I mean, you see, you see it a little bit in the movie. The room, it's it's a small cinema. It, it probably they cram the chairs in there. They probably have a hundred people in there, and we had we had packed that that hall. So it was all the staff and and their friends and colleagues and filmmakers that I knew from outside Afghan Films came, and it was a party. I mean, people just adored this film, and they talked and they gave speeches, and and it was an absolute celebration. And um, and then we did another screening, which um, unfortunately we had some bad luck. We we had planned to do a screening uh, in the Serena Hotel, which is a, a hotel in downtown Kabul, so that we could invite some of the VIPs because we were planning to distribute actually in Afghanistan. So we wanted to have some of the, some VIPs come, some some political people, et cetera, who wouldn't feel comfortable um, uh, going somewhere that wasn't secure. But unfortunately, we, we the day that, that we screened, there was a bomb threat on the hotel and 
uh, also a flash flood across, and it was like the worst luck ever. But we saw about 25 people come to that one. And, and so it was, it was an opportunity to share it with some people. But um, what happened then was that the, the new president of Afghan film, Sahra Karimi, who became a little bit well-known through what happened on August 15th, because she, she wrote a, a kind of famous open letter. She um, she's a wonderful Afghan filmmaker who've been living in the Czech Republic. She, um, she, she loved the film and, and, and uh, asked us if she could help us to distribute it across the country. So we were making plans with her in order to kind of do some kind of, and there's a history of mobile cinema in Afghanistan. Actually, Afghan films actually had mobile cinema as part of what they did early on, like in the 60s and 70s. And so um, we were thinking, we're playing with some ideas uh, to do either a mobile cinema or to just distribute it uh, through television and, and, and the few cinemas that remain. But um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I don't know that that will ever happen now, but, um, which is a real shame, but um, I, I, I just, the reaction from Afghans is, is so gratifying for me because it feel like it speaks a little bit more directly in some ways to somebody who has more knowledge to coming yeah. with more knowledge, you know, because it's, it's there's some elements that otherwise can be a bit, um, I don't know, a bit confusing, I think, or a bit dense maybe. But uh, yeah, so it does, the, the reactions of, of, of so far have been really great. So and my follow up on that one, just to follow up now yeah. with the, the new regime taking over with the mm -hmm. Taliban, can and, and that was going to be my follow up is can it be seen again, right? Can, can this be shown mm -hmm. or how would it be received now? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I think the, the kind of prevailing feeling is more like fear that the Taliban regime will destroy the films, which are now inside the presidential yeah. palace compound um, that they control. So, um, you know, I, I it's too early to try and, and do anything. Um, but, you know, I mean, if things were to stabilize in five years from now, there's a stable government that's still led by the Taliban and, you know, there's still cinema and they haven't... Uh, they haven't issued any ban on on cinema then you know we could we could potentially look into that but the thing that we have to be careful about is that um the film involves people who uh could be vulnerable right so we mm -hmm. have to be careful mm -hmm. in that sense and in fact since uh, august 15th i've been uh along with my producer from this project and the nfb and other partners we've been really trying to find asylum for people who are in this film and and other filmmakers who we know and uh, archivists that helped us and so um yeah so right now our first thought is for people's safety but eventually yeah uh, and this film was on uh, al jazeera uh recently so um and what we did was we hid identities so there's a lot more blurred faces and uh and changed names well there were none in, in the original but we, that's what we had to do to make it uh, safer for our for our participants do you have time to take one more question there's a question sure. from yeah. asia asia uh, no, you answered it. It was about like, what's the current state of like where the films are now, and then you answered that, so it's okay. Okay, okay. So, did uh, if, in terms of outreach, we can uh, we can post with anything you want, um, Ariel, or you can you can you can make a pitch now if you have time, whatever. Yeah. No, I mean I don't know if there's any filmmakers in in the crowd other than Asia, um, but uh, who's already had probably heard my pitch, but. I just wanted to um, say that, um, you know, in my current job as the, the producer, the Quebec producer for the NFB's um, English documentary program, I would love to hear from any of you um, with your pitches. Um, so I'm going to put my email into the chat here. Um, and um, if you're a filmmaker, thanks, Christine. Um, you know, and you and you have an interest, you have a pitch, you have a film that needs support and, you know, don't hesitate to uh, send it to me at that address. Great. Well, I'm so happy you met, we, we have, uh, you came, you were able to make it, Ariel. I think that was, uh, again, I think you've made an extraordinary film for all audiences uh, and it's a real eye opener uh, as well as, uh, you know, in terms of documentary filmmaking, but also in terms of, of the subject matter. So uh, uh, good you. luck and uh, we'll be in touch and thanks everyone for your interest. <laughs>